G'day guys and gal. The Horus Heresy was thousands upon thousands of coin flips and butterfly effect moments that all dramatically impacted the final result. Because of that, it would only really take a handful of decisions or moments to change to create an entirely different outcome. If Corvus had been allowed to kill Lorgar without Conrad's intervention, the Shadow Crusade would have been severely hampered and Gilliman probably would have devastated the traitors. If Sanguinius had been allowed to merge with the Red Angel, his corruption would have doomed the Imperium for sure. Thus, with so many variables, it's easy and quite fun to learn about or read alternative heresies. One that I'm interested in, but also kind of doesn't exist, is the Lionel Heresy, with Paint Noob having created some of the most stunning artworks I've seen, making traders loyalist and making the loyalist traitor. He also provided some basic synopsis and lore, however, as far as I know, that's all there is. So I thought, why not merge Paint Noob synopsises and artworks with my own alternative heresy, putting the lion as the arch traitor. I know a lot of you guys have wanted me to create my own for a while, so I think this is a great way to go about it that isn't entirely from scratch. Huge shout out to Paint Noob for the incredibly epic artworks, I'll link his Instagram below. Before we get started, earlier this month I spoke about Tacticus, and the result was so positive from you guys that they've partnered up with me again for this month to talk about their new Tyranid faction release, which has been kicked off with the Neurothrobe. As I've said, I love Tacticus, I'm literally addicted to it, so it's awesome to see the Nids go from antagonist to playable faction. The Neurothrobe's abilities are pretty unique, designed as a single target DPS with a bit of survivability in regards to his active ability. However, it's his passive which gets me moist. Basically, you can stack an obscenely high amount of damage on a single target, let's say a boss, when used with the right team comp. Overall, a great start to the Nids, and with an event running right now on unlocking him, it's a perfect time to sign up for free using the QR code on screen or link below. And if Tyranids aren't your thing, Tacticus has a bunch of other factions like the Dark Angels, Space Wolves, Death Guard, Elder, with many more and more in the way. Easily my favorite mobile game, don't sleep on this one. Cheers to Tacticus for sponsoring this video. Today we'll go over the key points of the Lionel Heresy, detailing why different Primarchs fell or remained loyal, and how the Heresy ended up overall. Uh, let's get into it. <laughs> The biggest change off the bat is that the Lion, not Horus, is chosen as Warmaster. The Lion was arguably the second pick for Warmaster and was generally more respected than Horus. There's even a theory that the Emperor deliberately passed over the more capable Lion in order to ensure his loyalty due to whoever being chosen as Warmaster eventually being corrupted. The Lion would prove to be an exceptional Warmaster. He had none of the doubt and insecurity of Horus. It was like being chosen as Warmaster vindicated all of his actions and attitudes. He used ruthlessness, secrecy, and destruction as his weapons as the crusade reached all new heights. Chaos had been denied an easy heresy with the lion's loyalty and secrecy, but they would still try make do. They lure the lion to a distant Xeno empire under the guise of the return of the Rungdung. However, these creatures weren't the Xenos that the lion had crushed in years past. They were malformed, sulfurous things of hate and malice. The lion tore through them, hell-bent on reaching their commander. Their lord was a twisted thing, a giant cackling bird with two heads. The lion charged forth, weathering its psychic assaults. He plunged his blade into it. However, as Titsnitch always says, just as planned. The moment the blade entered the demon's body, the lion's mind was connected to its own. The demon, Kairos Fate Weaver, showed the lion a full vision of everything that would occur in the original heresy. Horus's fall, the Isfun drop site massacre, the siege of terror, the wounding of the emperor, and then the 10,000 years of decay ending in the opening of the Great Rift and the doom of the Imperium. He saw it all. As the vision ended, he destroyed Kairos's body and backed away. Shocked at what he had seen, the lion enters into a meditation to decide what to do. He saw through the lies and deception of the vision as he is the master of his own mind. Thus he saw that the vision was a true one, based on a simple decision of Horus being Warmaster instead of him. In the meantime, much of the same things play out, which is what I really like about this heresy. Dumb shit or nonsensical decisions didn't have to occur for Primax to swap. Lorga is humiliated on Monarchia, with Erebus and Corferon pushing him to search for the Chaos Gods instead. Lorga would go on his pilgrimage, however it wouldn't go to Chaos's plan. He saw nothing but thirsting, desperate gods, dependent on mortal faith and praise to exist. He saw their malice and their desire to destroy. They didn't give a fuck about mankind. Mankind was just another on a long list of of races for them to corrupt, destroy, and then move on. He saw the fall of the Elder as a lesson, not to embrace chaos, but to utterly reject it and fight it wherever it may rear its ugly head. Lorgar saw why the Emperor denied gods, his own divinity, and kept things from his sons. He saw the dangers of the warp and realized his father was right all along. However, this completely reignited his faith in the Emperor as a god. 
Leaving the pilgrimage, Lorgas sought to punish Erebus and Corferon for their heresy and attempt to manipulate him. Corferon noticed something was off about things and fled, whilst the ever arrogant Erebus, who believed he knew every possible future, approached Lorgar with a smile. Erebus opened his mouth to speak, but found his chest caved in as as fast as lightning, Lorgar struck him with a luminarium. However, death was too kind of fate for Erebus, as Lorgar then channeled his nascent but now righteous psychic energy into setting Erebus alight in holy fire. Erebus would burn forevermore in complete agony as a lesson and warning to all other heretics. Argultal would be allowed to live with Lorgar vowing to purge the demon from him. At a similar time, Conrad Curse underwent a huge attitude change. He was a prick because he thought that his visions were inevitable and all he saw was dark bad shit. But with the lion being chosen as Warmaster instead of Horus, a complete contradiction to his visions, he chose to reflect and think more. He spent some time with Sanguinius, discussing the nature of foresight and why Sanguinius did not suffer the mental instability of Conrad. It was simple. Sanguinius knew that no fate was certain, so he did not allow his visions to control or mess with him. Him. Adopting this attitude, Conrad was finally free of his insanity, finding he now had much more control of his visions. With this newfound mental freedom, he focused more on justice and law rather than his other bullshit, purging his legion of the dregs and sadistic criminals and reforming it into the Emperor's original vision, the ultimate hunters of the sinner. Now back to the lion. With the lion's meditations complete, he realized that the Primarchs and Space Marine legions were incredibly flawed things. Mankind would never be safe while the weak links existed. He saw the traitors of the heresy as those weak links, Horus, Angron, Kurs, and the others. In order to secure the Emperor's domain, there had to be a purge, and in purging those weak links, he also grimly accepted that he and his brothers would also be purged. But only when his sword fell on the heart of the last true traitor would he accept his own demise. While this may seem like a just cause, the Lion's idea of achieving his goal, no matter the cost, meant that he was more than happy to use Chaos as a weapon to destroy his brothers. He also knew that many of his brothers would not attack the weak links unprovoked, hence he had to be the one to start the war and then use framing, lies and blame to get some of the more steadfast brothers on his side. He wanted the original loyalists on his side as he saw that they resisted Horus in the original heresy. To this end, taking notes from the vision, the Lion sent Sanguinius into the trap of Cygnus Prime to fight the Corner and Slaneshi demons. However, he also sent a Dark Angel kill team to go assassinate Meros prior to this, poisoning the unconscious warrior while he recovered from his wounding by the Eldar. They did this as the Lion saw it was Meros who stopped Sanguinius's fall. Without Meros to stop him, and take his place, Sanguinius would fight his way through the chapel and walk into the Cornite Cauldron. In an attempt to stop the Red Thirst and Black Rage, Sanguinius merges with the Red Angel, becoming the champion of Corn. As promised, his legion is cured of the Red Thirst and Black Rage. However, it is replaced with the Red Rage, a constant state of anger and desire to engage in violence, kind of like a halfway point between Normal and the Black Rage. Sanguinius had become a living weapon that the Lion intended to use. The Council of Nikea played out in the same way, with Magnus being banned from using warp powers. The Lion knew, from his vision, that Magnus would learn of his heresy and attempt to warn the Emperor of the Lion's betrayal, and in doing so, would shatter the Webway Wards. The Lion, still loyal in his own way, did not want the wards to break and ruin mankind's dream. Hence, he sent Rust to destroy Magnus before the ritual could be complete. Rust attacks Prospero, with the Thousand Suns having a lot more defenses available as Magnus had not blinded them. The war is exceptionally more vicious with higher casualties on the wolf's side. However, with Magnus stuck doing the ritual and Rust on the side of the Space Wolves, the wolves still have the slight upper hand. In canon, Titsnitch has a strange connection with the wolves, with the gates of Morkai exposing Space Wolves to the God of Change to test if they can resist him. That, as well as the magic of Fenris, reeks of a hidden influence. Titsnitch wishes Russ to win, so empowers his rune priests to achieve power that they never dreamed of. Russ, in his rage at seeing the Thousand Suns use all kind of magic on his wolves, as well as the thought that Magnus is performing a ritual to potentially kill the Emperor, something the Lion told him it was going to do, he embraces his inner power and becomes a living Tempest, tearing through the Thousand Suns. He reaches Magnus and attacks him mid-ritual at the peak of it. The psychic blowback of all the built-up energy is absorbed by Russ. The Wolf King's mind was already at a breaking point from the war, and with this explosion of energy, he absorbs the power of the warp and becomes a twisted changed thing. Prospero begins to freeze over as Magnus is able to save his last 10,000 warriors and retreat from the world, heading to Terra to warn his father in person. Russ falling to Titsnitch might seem insane, but Chaos does have a strong sense of irony. The Lion knew Rogaldorn would not join his forces against the Emperor willingly, so he orchestrated a number of events to bring him over. To do this, he enlisted the Alpha Legion's help, who after going down the same path and talking to the Cabal, joined up with the Lion's forces. With them, he forges pick feeds of Horus declaring war against the Lion. He 
also got them to kill some loyalist marines and replace them with Alpha Legionnaire operatives in a similar vein to what happened in Canon with the Raven Guard. They would then go report to Dawn that Horus had attacked them. And then when Dawn sends a force to investigate the rumors of heresy, Alpha Legionnaires armored as Lunar Wolves attack the ships and then the Dark Angels act as the saviors who swooped in and fought off the Lunar Wolves. All of this is presented to a confused Rogal. To take it further, the Lion secretly orders the Imperial Fist to be replaced with the Iron Warriors on Terra to make it seem as if this was a coup by Horus and Perturabo. Rogal was shattered he had failed his Emperor and allowed his warriors to be taken off Terra, with the Emperor now Horus and Perturabo's apparent hostage. In reality, the Emperor was so engrossed in his Webray project that he didn't have much thought or worry to put into something so trivial as a bodyguard change. Rogal paints his armor black and vows to constantly wear the pain glove until the Emperor has been freed from the traitors, a decision that would greatly hamper his judgment and allow him to overlook the more unsavory parts of the Lion's heresy. Overall, there is some Legion culling within the traitor legions, but really not much since the their overall goal was to save the Emperor, not kill him. Ferris was similarly tricked into joining the Heresy alongside Rebute. Corvus was confronted by Bellacor, who was able to coax out his inner warp demon by merging their essences, turning Corvus into a shadow demon. Due to the Lion's goal being the liberation of the Emperor and defeat of the would-be traitors in another timeline, it was a lot easier to convince his brothers to join him as compared to Horus, who had to convince his brothers to attack the Emperor in canon, for much less convincing reasons. The Isfun Dropside Massacre plays out, with the loyal Fulgrim who had never picked up the Layer Blade, Horus and his Lunar Wolves, as well as Conrad Curse and his Reformed Legion. They face off against the Lion, Russ, Ferris Manus, and Vulcan, who had been convinced of the Lion's cause in a similar way to Dawn, Rebute, and Ferris. The two sides clash in a bloody engagement, with Korax, Dawn, Gilliman, and the Khan arriving as backup for Horus's forces, only to then turn their guns on them and begin the massacre. However, Conrad's foresight allows him to foresee this betrayal early, and he tells Horus who orders a retreat. Horus was engaged in a duel with the Lion, both Primarchs even matched when he got the warning from Conrad. Garviel Loken and Tarek Tolgadon attack the lion, giving Horus the chance to disengage. The lion kills both valiant lunar wolves. Even with Conrad's foresight, the trap still springs, however not as bad as in canon. Fulgrim and his legion hold back the traitors as Conrad and Horus make their escape. Conrad directing the escape using his foresight to determine which ships will make it to orbit, hence ensuring Horus and other key warriors are on the safe ones. Fabius, Saul Tarvitz, Lucius, and a few other thousand Emperor's children also escape, whilst Fulgrim and the rest of his legion hold off the traitors. They prove why they are the Emperor's children, as they fight with the fury of five legions. Fulgrim and Ferris engage in a duel. However, without the layer blade, Ferris overcomes Fulgrim and strikes him down killing him, his sacrifice allowing the rest to escape. In the meantime, the Khan is corrupted by Nurgle due to the teachings of Yasugai, convincing him of the cycles of death and rebirth, the eternal hunt and the never ending. Thus, Jagadai embraces the true form of Nurgle, a caring and charismatic demon prince, not the bitter, hateful Mortarian who was forced to join Nurgle against his will. Mortarian was on the sidelines when the heresy broke out, hence he travels to Prospero to try find out what has happened. He finds it a frozen wasteland, with a shard of Magnus left behind that broke off when Magnus used the overwhelming magic to teleport himself and his 10,000 surviving sons to a hidden ship in orbit. The Shard tells Mortarian what happened here. Mortarian is disgusted that Russ's hatred of Psychers took him this far, causing Morty to reflect and let go of his hatred. He would never, could never do something like this to another brother. The fact that Russ had fallen to the warp in the process reaffirmed Mortarian's new stance. He did not have to like Psychers, but he wouldn't let his hatred control him any longer. The Lion's heresy was a farce and was fundamentally tainted by the warp. Jagadai arrives, a reverse of canon, to try I talk to Mortarian of the benefits of Papa Nurgle, and how they have to free the Emperor from Horus' control. In truth, the Khan doesn't give a fuck about the Emperor. He never liked him and only saw him as a tyrant. The Heresy is just a great excuse to dispose of him. Mortarian was disgusted with Jagadai, saw through his lies, and could smell the stink of corruption on him. The two brothers fight, with Jagadai's resilience being much greater than Morty had thought possible. In the meantime, the hidden Nurgleite traitors within the Death Guard fleet, led by Typhon, lead a coup to try to take control. However, it is thought Awarded by Nathaniel Garo, who is able to lock a teleportation beam on Mortarian and bring him back to the ship. Mortarian then kills Typhon, saving the soul of the Legion. Obviously, I don't have the time in one video to go over every single event that could occur between now and the Siege of Terror, however, with the Lion at the helm, a man who would be much less corrupted by Chaos than Horus, as well as more competent trader Primarchs, he would reach Terror much quicker. But I'll give some cool lore points to get us there. 
Ferris engages Petarabo's forces in the Soul System on Saturn, resulting in him being beaten and severely wounded. This tips Ferris into the mindset of the flesh being weak, thus his weakened form is taken away as he rebuilds his body into a perfect mechanical abomination, ascending to become a demon of Slaanesh as he does so. The Eldar get more involved in the heresy, attempting to take out Vulcan. Vulcan eats an avatar of Cain, ascending to demonhood as he does so and gaining some of its characteristics. However, the Elder are able to do enough to keep Vulcan busy. Busy. That, alongside Vulcan's vow of restraint on Caldera, caused his ascension to Demon Prince to literally lock him up in the warp and Eye of Terror only, where he would go on to take the Soul Forge from Vashtor and begin creating devastating weapons of war for the traitors. Angron and Lorga would attack the now traitorous Ultramar, with Lorga pledging to save Angron from the nails. Gilliman is able to fight them off, severely wounding Angron in the process by cutting off both of his legs. Lorgar takes Angron to safety instead of killing the weakened Gilliman, as he loves his brother Angron. The invasion of Ultramar allows Lorgar to discover a Dark Age of Technology artifact that, while unable to remove Angron's nails, halts the degradation. Thus, Angron remains angry, but still alive. Perturabo engages Alpharis on Pluto, killing the Alpha Legionnaire Primarch, with Amigon then extracting his entire legion from the heresy. Russ and his legion assail the web Way, forcing the Emperor to remain on the throne. However, the damage is less severe than what Magnus caused in canon. Magnus speaks with the Emperor and discovers that there is no cure for the flesh change. Hence, he leads his legion on multiple suicidal attacks on the traitors, winning a number of key battles at great cost, which allow more of his loyal brothers to reach Terra. The final battle being against Russ, as Magnus uses the last of his sons to outplay and wipe out a huge chunk of the Space Wolves. Magnus returns to Terra with only Araman still left alive. To thank Magnus, the Emperor directs him to Titan, where his new legion will be rebuilt. Magnus is given the Grey Knights, renamed the Thousand Sons in honor of his legion's sacrifice. However, Magnus's new legion has none of his gene seed in it. The Siege of Terror kicks off with Mortarian, Horus, and Perturabo with their accompanying legions on the defense. Magnus is also present, with Lorgar, Angron, and Conrad Curse on their way. The traitors are also there in full force, minus Vulcan and Ferris. However, the Iron Hands and Salamanders are there in great number. The Lion's mastery of war, combined with his overwhelming force, caused havoc. However, Perturabo's god-tier siege defense proves to be a match. The Karn and Mortarian battle, with Morty overcoming the vicious diseases of of the Khan, using his own resilience and the recent embracement of his psychic powers that were taught to him by Magnus, he banishes the Maggot Khan back to the garden. However, it's not enough as the traitors push closer and closer in. They are overall just more effective than the traitors in canon. Dawn engages Perturabo and severely wounds the Lord of Iron, forcing Perti to be placed in a dreadnought to survive. Despite Morty's win over the Khan, he was severely wounded as well and also cannot help much anymore. Thus, Horus stands alone in front of the Eternity Gate, facing down his traitorous brothers. Then, on a sunless world, the sun rises. The Emperor comes forth through the gate, Magnus sitting on the throne to allow him the respite. This causes a massive split in the traitor forces. They had come to save the Emperor from Horus, yet here the Emperor stood, next to Horus and facing them down. Gilliman, his own ambitious having been stoked by chaos with a desire to be the next Emperor, sees the situation clearly. The Lion and Dawn were twisted, but ultimately believed that they were loyal. However, Sanguinius, Russ, the Death Guard, the Iron Hands, the Salamanders, and Corp are all corrupted and are being used by Chaos to try kill the Emperor. Gilliman immediately orders a withdrawal to avoid the oncoming carnage as the traitors turn upon each other. At the same time as the Emperor, Horus, the Loyalist Marines, and the Custodians charge. Luther is also amongst the Loyalists here. Sanguinis engages Horus in a battle as the Emperor takes on Russ and Corvus. Dawn enters a berserk rage as the last of his sanity breaks as he realizes what he has done. His Imperial fists attack everyone on both sides, especially the retreating Ultramarines who he sees as cowards. Sanguinis strikes Horus down, his Cornite power too much for the favored son. Seeing Horus die, the Emperor lashes out, banishing both Russ and Corvus after suffering wounds. Him and Sanguinis then lunge at each other. The Avatar of Khorne, the Blood God of War, versus the master of mankind. The lion watches, unmoving. He hears the laughter of thirsting gods as everything finally makes sense. To prevent the shattering of the Emperor's realm, he has caused it. He sees his own folly, saying to himself, loyalty is its own reward in a bitter tone. Seeing that he has never truly been loyal, thus this was his reward. The lion drops his sword. Luther approaches him. No words are exchanged, just bitter disappointment as Luther shoves his sword through the lion's chest. 
the line falls to the ground and is dragged away by Corswain and the other Dark Angels. The Emperor and Sanguinius's duel peaks with Sang mortally wounding the Big E as the Big E banishes the true Red Angel. The Emperor collapses and is then carried to the Golden Throne by Constantine Valdor. With Sanguinius gone, the traitors begin to rout as reports of the Night Lords, Word Bearers, and World Eaters arrival. Rogel Dawn withdraws from Terra in shame, vowing to destroy the traitors but also knowing he also must destroy the loyalists who hunt him, becoming a true renegade. The Big E is placed upon the Golden Throne. Malkador and Lorgar discuss the power of faith and its impact on the Emperor's life force. They craft the Imperial Cult, guiding it with better tenets of faith but also compassion, creating a less dark Imperium. This power also allows Fulgrim to periodically return as a living saint, countering the Iron Hands and Ferris whenever they appear in real space. Amegan returns to the Imperium and pledges to the Loyalists, vowing to make amends for his brother's mistakes as he goes on to take control of the Death Watch. For the Lion, he remains in a coma and goes missing within the bowels of the Rock, the Watchers in the Dark keeping him asleep to prevent his return reuniting the forces of Chaos. Gilliman becomes the new War Master, directing the Black Crusades against the Imperium as he himself rejects Chaos Corruption. There is a bit more lore that occurs leading up to the current setting of the alternative timeline, but that is the key lore points of the Lionel Heresy. Using paint Noob's artworks and synopsises combined with my own thoughts on what a good heresy could look like. As I said, a proper heresy is a shitload of books, so there are many characters and interesting topics that would also change in this timeline, as well as a lot of fleshing out to do for how each individual trader did actually end up falling, but I can't be fucked making a 100 hour long video. If you enjoy the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be, where we have a more sexualized alternative timeline in both live action cosplay and sexy Warhammer pinups. Hit the subscribe button and hit the real subscribe button for more alternative heresy content. Join the Discord for more memes and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.